Hey, it's Francis Lamb, host of The Splendid Table. Every week on our show, we talk about food and cooking and the meanings of food and cooking. We talk with the most interesting people in food about their techniques, their culture, and everything in between. Whether it's about how fried chicken took over the world or how Instagram changes the way people are actually eating. It's a food show where everyone is welcome. Come join us. You can listen to The Splendid Table wherever you get your podcasts. Hearst Ranch is a proud sponsor of the Heritage Radio Network. Learn more about Hearst Ranch at HearstRanch.com. You're listening to Heritage Radio Network. I think one thing to note that's really important, especially as we get to the discussion of biotechnology in food, is that the inauthentic is just as productive as the authentic. Oftentimes these are contrasted, but um, they don't exist without one another, right? They're really an important kind of, not just binary, um, but way in which people navigate food waste and consuming uh, authentic food waste and foods as part of an identity as well. The contrast of authentic versus inauthentic has so much cultural power often getting conflated with good, bad, real, and fake, as you just heard from cultural anthropologist Dr. Lauren Crossland Marr. Today on Meet in 3, we're going to keep it real with you. Or are we? <laughs> the search for authenticity is key to understanding ourselves and our food, but it also brings up some thorny questions. What history do we value? How do we move into the future? What's real and who decides? I'm Taylor Early, and this is Meet and Three on HRN. Meet and Three. Meet and Three. Meet and Three. One meet, three sides. Food, news, and storytelling. A square meal for your ears. Meet and Three. Most of our conversations around authenticity center cultural narratives, steeped in ideas of place, tradition, and time. But what happens to our understanding of the authentic when biotechnology comes into play? Elizabeth Fisher investigates this question through the lens of gene editing technology. Have you ever heard of clustered, regularly, space short, palindromic repeats? I didn't think so. But have you heard of the acronym CRISPR? Often called genetic scissors, CRISPR is a gene editing technology. It allows scientists to turn on or off genes in cells and organisms. CRISPR has caused a firestorm for its potential uses in biomedicine. But cultural anthropologist Dr. Lauren Crossland Marr studied the technology's application in agriculture. It's still really early in the technology's life cycle, especially as it's applied to food. So we're only seeing just a few things available now like stress-reducing tomatoes in Japan. Lauren investigated this GABA-enriched tomato and other CRISPR foods in the podcast series, A CRISPR Bite, released last fall. CRISPR and GMOs are often compared, and for good reason. Both technologies alter the genetic material of an organism. But the two work in different ways and may very well be used together. That's not been much of the conversation, but I really do believe that they will be used together. GMOs are transgenic, which means foreign DNA is inserted into the genome that scientists wish to change, whereas CRISPR turns genes on or off within the same genome. Another notable distinction between the two is cost. CRISPR is actually a lot cheaper to do. So these startups are creating new products and they can do it much cheaper than they could with something like GMOs. CRISPR's potential extends far beyond making tomatoes that promote relaxation. Some scientists propose that it will address grand problems like climate change. Lauren and several co-authors published a paper in New Genetics and Society looking at conversations about CRISPR circulating on Twitter. And one of the things that we highlight there is that much of the conversation is actually created by scientists. And so these scientists have a lot of technological optimism, but technology is only as good as how we use it, right? CRISPR technology is being used to support industrial agriculture. As CRISPR foods become increasingly available, how will consumers, so often partial to ideas of naturalness and authenticity, respond? Before diving into the world of CRISPR, Lauren spent time in Milan, Italy, researching the made-in-Italy sector. 
She also worked with an Islamic community in Italy, developing a halal certification. Questions about who and what determines a food's authenticity guided her work. So in Italy, halal certifiers do not allow GMOs in their products. And this is because technology is seen as something contrastive to authenticity. Now in the United States, actually, GMOs are allowed to be halal certified. Just changing the context here, we see differences in the ways in which people understand things like GMOs and innovation in food technology. It's not that technology is separate from kind of our socio-cultural milieu, In fact, it's incredibly embedded in how we think about the world. The wish to preserve authenticity may seem like an opposing force to the drive towards innovation in food ways. But these ideas are not binary. Instead, they point to the convolution of consumer desires and the struggle to simultaneously adapt to and conserve a changing world. Having those two seemingly conflicting ideas, you know, I think it actually points to in a sense of form of world making that we have through food. For our next story, Danielle Flitter takes us to CDMX. The city itself is a showcase of the country's cuisine, but it's also a hotbed for international influences on old favorites. Danielle sat down with Mexico City-based personal chef Ron Dutes to discuss what authenticity means for him. My name is Chef Ron Dutes. I'm from New York City. I now live in Mexico City. Uh, I've been in the culinary industry for over 20 years now. Mexico City is just this place, whether you cook or not, the food is inspiring. But I think that for people that cook, from at least my experience, it's like there's so many new ingredients. There's so many distinct flavors. And so what has that experience been for you as you have learned Mexican food and incorporated that into your own cuisine? Yeah. Um, Well, my experience coming here and being introduced to all these new Mexican ingredients and Mexican food was, was, it was pretty overwhelming at first um, and exciting. You know, I really, I really love the mercados here. Uh, There's over 300 in the city and I've been trying to get to all of them, which is like, seems like an almost impossible task. I really like that the tiendas are like individually run and you can really build relationships with those people and get to know them. Yeah, absolutely. Other than the markets themselves and the ingredients, how do you feel like living in Mexico has impacted your cuisine? I've been using more Mexican ingredients and like it took me a little bit to like really grasp what Mexican cuisine was because obviously we have some idea of what it is from being from the States, you know, but it's completely different. So just incorporating those things slowly, really trying to eat different Mexican foods and gave me a better grasp of what the idea of like a dish, a familiar and comforting dish is to Mexican people. And I've been able to incorporate it into my own style of cooking. And uh, I think I'm just becoming a more well-rounded chef because of it. Okay, so what does authenticity mean to you? To me, it's just like being yourself as much as you possibly can and kind of like not letting those you know, whatever walls you might have up, like hinder that. And as far as in the culinary field, just like same thing, except with with creativity. Uh, It's really tough because there are a lot of purists out there. Uh, I do this guacamole with goat cheese, caramelized onions, and like balsamic reduction, right? Which is a little out of the, more out of the box. My clients, I found, seem to love it. You know what I mean? Because if like the flavors work together, they work together. You know, am I being authentic to the culture in that respect? Eh, maybe not, but I'm being authentic to myself and like what I think tastes good. And uh, the clients that resonate with that will will like uh, flock to that and appreciate that. So I think it's more important to be authentic to myself while still having some respect for the culture around me. Hearst Ranch is a proud sponsor of the Heritage Radio Network. The Hearst family has been raising cattle on the rich, sustainable native grasslands of California's Central Coast for over 150 years. Piedra Blanca Rancho in San Simeon is the original Hearst Ranch, founded by George Hearst in 1865. George's son was the famous publisher, William Randolph Hearst. In addition to being known for building the iconic Hearst Castle, William was, like his father before him, an avid rancher. In his words, I would rather spend a month at the ranch than any place in the world. 
thanks to one of the largest land conservation easements in California history, a joint effort with the California Rangeland Trust, the American Land Conservancy, and the state of California, the working landscape at Hearst Ranch will be preserved forever. Learn more about Hearst Ranch at hearstranch.com. Welcome back to Meet and Three. So we've explored some of the bounds of authenticity, what it is, what it isn't, and how we can understand it when science or globalization comes into play. But it's also worth asking why we care so much about authenticity right now anyways. Up next, Sophia Hooper goes searching for the authenticity-shaped hole inside all our hearts. Hold on, I'm climbing onto my soapbox. Okay. I want to make the argument that when it comes to food and politics, authenticity is a tool. Well, I personally uh, do not believe in the concept of authenticity. Here to back me up is author of the book Gastronativism, Fabio Parasecoli. I'm a professor of food studies in the nutrition and food studies department at New York University. Here's what we mean. You know that feeling you get when you walk into a restaurant and you see an old Hispanic-looking lady making the tortillas you're about to eat? Or when they promise you they make real wood-fired pizza and they proudly show you the certificate from pizza school? It feels better knowing that what you're consuming has a history. For me, what's important is not what is authentic, but why are we even talking about authenticity? Why do we want authenticity so badly? What is it that we're searching for? Fabio would say, part of the answer is globalization. I think authenticity has emerged as a central concept in contemporary food culture because it provides protection and anchorage against the perceived uh, omnipresence of a globalization that is experienced as invasive and flattening. Authenticity become an element of anchorage for identity. If you're American and you've ever gone abroad, you know how odd it feels to find Burger Kings and McDonald's in other countries. Even when you try local cuisines, it's likely the produce used to create those authentic meals was grown in a different country. It might even be packaged in the same cans or under the same brand names you find at home. If you can find everything everywhere, What does it mean for food to be from somewhere? That is a threatening question, in some cases real, in some cases exaggerated, to whole ways of life, identities, and communities. It applies to other forms of culture, but especially the food we eat. Our connection with food is not only uh, practical, because food is fuel, we need it to survive. It is not only cultural, but it's also very emotional. And for this reason, it is easy to turn into a political tool. Sometimes when we start talking about food, we don't care so much about fact, history, information. It's what we feel is right in our guts. The thing is, the stories we tell about authenticity and food are often myth as much as fact. Many of them rely on this idea of, as Fabio says in his book, the good old days of agriculture. When everything was genuine, food production was local, and agrobiodiversity thrived. We all know those good old days are, to some extent, contrived. Cultures have always mixed and influenced each other, whether it was through equal cultural exchange, trade, or domination. And agriculture has almost always gone hand in hand with exploitation. But those contrived stories have real consequences. Some of them are good. They help keep cultures alive where they are threatened. They unite people with similar values across borders. But they also lead to riots, like in the case of India's beef lynchings. They lead to discriminatory laws, like the northern Italian town that banned new ethnic restaurants from the historic quarter because they weren't authentic, never mind what the residents of the town actually looked like or ate in their day to day. These stories are decisions about whose experiences are good enough to count as culture. There's a lot more to say, but authenticity, at its simplest, is whatever is happening wherever you are. All I ask is that the next time you're being served a plate of authenticity, you keep your wits about you. Whether you're drinking wine out of a bottle or a box, the grapes it's made from have been shaped by their terroir. Don't know what terroir is or where it originated? Well, pour yourself a glass and let food journalist Addison Austin Liu tell you 
all about it. Cheers! Pinot Noir, one of the oldest grapes there is. Been around since the Roman Empire. Grown all over the world. Do you know why the wine we make tastes so distinctly different from a Pinot made in, say, Napa or Tuscany? Mm -mm. Same grape. The difference is where it's been. The summer heat wave gets you a more exotic tropical flavor. High elevation gives you an acidic varietal and so on. The products of the environment. The terroir, as the French call it. Can't know what a grape is, so you know what it's been through. The clip you just heard is from Argyle, a recently released espionage thrill ride. Samuel L. Jackson's character is leading the protagonist, Ellie, around a sprawling vineyard, firmly establishing terroir as a product of French viticulture. Terroir may seem like an innocent descriptive word, but it has roots in French colonialism. This isn't to say the unique conditions that an agricultural product arises from won't have an effect on the resulting food. But France pushed the concept of terroir to discredit Algerian wine as it gained traction in the global market. France invaded Algeria in 1830, and viticulture was quickly used to prove how effective and virtuous colonialism could be. Propaganda marketed Algeria as an agricultural utopia, drawing many settlers across the Mediterranean. Land was stolen from the indigenous people, leaving them unable to grow ancestral crops. This forced them to work on vineyards to survive. In just 20 years, Algeria's native population declined from 4 million to 2.3 million due to war, dislocation, illness, and disruption of their food supply. The goal of co-opting Algeria's agricultural potential was to complement the French economy, not compete with it. But the mid-1850s European vine blight changed everything. The blight was a species of aphid, also known as grape phylloxera, which was likely carried from America by Victorian-era botanists. As a response to their nationwide failing crops, France outsourced wine production to their colonies. Then, they raced to find a solution for phylloxera. Ironically, considering staunch French identity built around wine, it was grafting pest-resistant American varietals onto French vines that saved the day. Some winemakers opposed this process, calling it unpatriotic, and refused to graft the plants, opting for chemical methods instead. This so-called reconstitution took time, though, and in the intervening years, Algeria became a viticulture powerhouse. Between the late 1880s and early 1970s, they grew to be the fourth largest producer of wine in the world. In the years before World War I, Algeria accounted for 67% of wine exports globally, while France was only 12%. And this is the part of the story where terroir comes in. Defining terroir was meant to bring the wine industry back to France by establishing a framework for quality, intentionally excluding Algeria. Now, the understanding that soil and climate affect flavor has been around for more than a thousand years and was mostly attached to the study of geology and rural heritage. What's important to understand here is that terroir is not only a biological fact, but also utilized as an ever-evolving marketing strategy. The countries who write these definitions tend to have economic clout and a loud international voice. They create codified rules around terroir that favor themselves. When Algeria was at the height of its winemaking, France not only pushed terroir into mainstream vocabulary, but laid the groundwork for geographic indication. This is a label given to agricultural products that designates their authenticity and quality based on how and where they are produced. Today, Europe has the most geographic indications, while Africa only has 0.001% of them. A certain level of standardization is required to qualify for these indicators. Despite being an attempt to protect a product, standardization negates terroir. Producers are now trying to meet a standard as opposed to allowing a location's natural diversity to determine outcome. Which begs the question, is something authentic if we leave it be, or when we demand a strict set of rules around its production to assure its consistency? But back to Algeria. Wine had become a painful symbol of oppression, 
Following the end of World War II, revolution was brewing, and vineyards became a target. Workers abandoned their jobs, joined resistance movements, hacked down vines, and attacked vineyard owners. After over a century fighting for independence, Algeria became a sovereign country in 1962. Between the terroir strategy and the French population returning to Europe post-war, the Algerian wine industry collapsed. Today, there is only one private and one state-owned winemaker left. The award-winning wine they produce suggests further potential for rebound, but political and religious pressures due to Muslim majority make it difficult. So, terroir has defined one wine industry and brought the downfall of another. What does it do for us today? Terroir is a hallmark of authenticity. And we all know authentic is a huge buzzword in the modern food space. When you think about it, we don't start to talk about authenticity until a product is removed from its origin. The Japanese probably don't sit around talking about the authenticity of their own food, for example. And it isn't until someone sits at a sushi bar outside of Japan that they wax poetic about authenticity. Throwing around this term has social, economic, and political benefits, as we have seen. But not just for the producer, also the consumer. It becomes a status symbol if you know where to find the most authentic Japanese food, or can afford a wine with particular terroir. But can something definitively be called authentic, except for our own individual experiences? In the same way that a grape varietal grown in different regions will produce wine with different flavor properties, our perception of a meal will change depending on our location and previous experiences with that food. We are shaped by our environment, and so is what we consume. The long-standing politics of cuisine has demanded that rules be written to determine authenticity. But that leaves us only idolizing the flavors those in power want us to. How can we pull terroir back to an awareness that environment changes flavor, but no strict hierarchy need apply? We can acknowledge differences in our food and enjoy it without using that to determine quality, aside from our own personal preferences. Cuisine evolves, palates change, and we can rewrite our own definitions of authenticity. That's our show. Thanks for listening. Learn more about the guests and topics we touched on this week by checking out our show notes. This episode of Meet and Three was reported by Elizabeth Fisher, Daniel Flitter, Sophia Hooper, and Addison Austin Liu. Our lead producer on this episode was Sophia Hooper, with support from Hannah Chenard. Meet and Three is produced by H. Conley and me, Taylor Early. Our audio engineer for this episode was H. Conley. Our theme song was composed by Breakmaster Cylinder. This program is supported in part by public funds from the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs in partnership with the City Council. Meet and 3 is powered by Simplecast. Meet and 3 is a production of Heritage Radio Network, the world's pioneer food radio station. Learn more at heritageradionetwork.org and follow us at heritage underscore radio. And please stay in touch. Whether you have a story idea or just like to say hey, write us at ideas at meetin3.nyc and that's all spelled out. Craft cocktails, from the classics to zero-proof drinks, are all around us. But what if we told you that craft cocktails are actually a relatively recent addition to the culinary scene? My name is Tony Tipton Martin, and I'm the editor-in-chief of Cook's Country at America's Test Kitchen. I want to introduce you to a podcast mini-series I'm hosting called 100 Proof, The Journey of the American Cocktail. Over six episodes, We'll look at how mixed drinks offer us a window into what was happening in America during the dawn of the cocktail. We'll then take you to the present day to contemplate what forces led to our modern cocktail renaissance. And along the way, we'll of course be sharing cocktail recipes with you. Subscribe to Proof from America's Test Kitchen so you won't miss the first episode. It drops on Thursday, May 23rd. Again, that's Proof, P-R-O-O-F, from America's Test Kitchen. Cheers.